So we're going to start unit two, which is structures and properties of matter. And we're going to start by looking at Bohr's model of the atom, followed by the quantum mechanical model of the atom. So before we proceed any further, it's important that we understand the fundamentals of chemistry. In an atom, we see here in the center that we have our nucleus. And our nucleus is composed of two types of subatomic particles. The first type is a proton. Protons have a positive charge. The second type is a neutron. And neutrons have no charge or a neutral charge. Finally, surrounding the nucleus, we see that we have electrons. And electrons are also a type of subatomic particle, and they have a negative charge. Now, in a neutral atom, we would see that we have an equal number of electrons and protons since the charge on a neutral atom is also zero. Now, in a chemical symbol, I'm, I'm going to use beryllium for our example, we see that we have three parts to it. This first part here refers to the element. We use the shorthand notation for the element. For beryllium, we use Be because that's what we would see if we looked on a periodic table. The top number here is the atomic number, and the atomic number refers to how many protons can be found in this element. It is also often represented by the letter Z. The bottom number here is our atomic mass. Now our atomic mass, often represented by the letter A, and it's basically the combined mass of all the neutrons and the protons in an atom. Now, electrons also do have mass, but their mass is incredibly small and basically negligible in comparison to the other two, so we don't really consider it in our overall atomic mass. Our atomic mass is also essentially the weighted averages of all the relative uh, abundances of each isotope for that element. Now, an isotope Isotopes are basically atoms that have the same number of protons, but they vary in their number of neutrons. So if you think about it, we have hydrogen. This is probably going to be the most common example that you'll see. We have hydrogen. Hydrogen has an atomic number of one and an atomic mass of one since it has no neutrons. However, there's also deuterium. Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogens. It has an atomic number of one as well, since they still have the same number of protons, but it has an atomic mass of two, since now it contains one proton and one neutron. And there you can see there's still the same number of protons, but they vary in their number of neutrons. Sometimes we'll have what's referred to as a radioisotopes, which are still isotopes of the element, but they have an unstable nucleus. And these nucleuses will decay and they will release gamma radiation, or they may even release a new particle entirely. So before we can fully understand Bohr's model, it's important that we understand a bit more about the atomic spectra. Now, spectroscopy is the study of how light interacts with different pieces of matter. So in a very basic sense of the word, we typically will have a beam of light that is shone through a slit and it will hit the sample and interact with it. And this often causes the initial light beam to disperse into its different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation that are hidden within this one beam, which is why we see in this diagram below a white beam goes in and it comes out with like many different colors because all these colors of light correspond to a different wavelength. And nowadays we have a lot more complicated machines that give us specific information on the amount of light absorbed and transmitted at different wavelengths and so forth when they interact with these different pieces of matter. But this basic idea is all we really need to know for now. The atomic spectrum of hydrogen is vital to Bohr's model of the elements. So to get the atomic spectrum of hydrogen, First, we have hydrogen gas exposed to an electric current. This electric current introduces energy to the system, which the molecule can then absorb. And this excess energy, it excites the electrons and it causes them to jump. Now, these electrons are going to return to a lower energy level, but as they do this, they release their excess energy in the form of light. And this beam of light is going to pass through a spectroscope 
and it is going to result in us seeing hydrogen's emission spectrum. Now there's two types of emission, emission spectrums that we could expect. The first is a continuous spectrum in which all the wavelengths of light uh, within a specific region are present, which is what we saw in the previous slide where we see all the colors fade into each other. However, a line spectrum, which is actually what we saw when we exposed hydrogen gas to this electric charge, only shows specific wavelengths of light. And this occurs when these electrons return to a lower energy level. Because these bands of light correspond to the excited electrons jumping to a different energy level and then emitting energy as they return to a lower energy level. Here is a diagram of hydrogen's atomic spectrum. And we see that there's four different bands of light and that they're unique, right? We see that they're not blending and we can distinctly make out four different bands. Turns out if we did this experiment with the other elements, each element also has a unique line spectrum that can identify it. And furthermore, it shows that these electrons can only exist at discrete energy levels. Otherwise we would get a continuous spectrum and these lines would all seem to blend together, but that's not what we got here. In other words, it shows that the electron's energy is quantized. So all this work paved the way for Bohr's model of the atom. Niels Bohr created the first quantum model of the atom where the electrons were found to exist in discrete energy levels, as opposed to previous models where the electrons were scattered randomly throughout the uh, system. Now here's a general depiction of Bohr's model, where we see that there are these rings around the nucleus which are referred to as orbits or shells, and they have discrete energy levels. In his model, it's also possible for these electrons to transition to a higher, a higher energy level when they absorb a specific quantity of energy. So we could see here that an electron in this orbit could transition to a higher energy level further away from the nucleus. It is also possible in the opposite sense for the electrons to transition to a lower energy level so we could see an electron return to the first energy level and they'll emit energy as they do this, often in the form of light. And that's why we see those colored bands in a line spectrum. It's the result of these excited uh, electrons returning down to a lower energy level. Now, the ground state of an atom is the lowest possible energy state that the atom can exist at. It is also the most stable state for that atom. So in this diagram here of, a, of Bohr's model of the atom, we see that we have three orbits surrounding the nucleus. In the first energy level, which we often represent with n equals one and corresponds to the energy level, uh, the first one can hold a maximum of two electrons. In energy level two, it can hold a maximum of eight electrons so that means overall, this atom can have a total of 10 electrons. And then finally, in our third energy level, which if you see the pattern is n equals three, it can also hold eight electrons in its orbit. So we can overall have 18 electrons in the whole atom if there's three energy levels. We also see that in this model, we have to fill our lower energy levels before we start to fill our higher energy levels. So initially, Bohr's model was praised since it seemed to provide an explanation for several of the behaviors of different elements. But over time, we started to see some discrepancies in his data. Turns out, Bohr's model is only really accurate for a hydrogen atom, but it starts to fail when we introduce more than one electron to the system. So even when we're drawing a Bohr-Rutherford diagram, which you may remember back from when we first started learning about chemistry, uh, they're really only useful for the first 20 elements. Afterwards, they start to become too large and too difficult to even keep up with. However, Bohr's model still holds value, and that's because it introduced the idea that energy is quantized within an atom and electrons exist at specific energy levels and they aren't randomly scattered throughout. 
Nowadays, though, we don't recognize Bohr's model as being very accurate, and we have come to realize that we need a better system to explain how electrons exist within an atom. And we also know that electrons don't actually orbit around the nucleus like Bohr's model suggests. They don't do that at all, actually. After Bohr, the new approach to understanding how atoms behaved is referred to as quantum mechanics or wave mechanics. So, French physicist Louis de Broglie originated the idea that electrons, which have classically been viewed at as a particle, also have wave-like properties. And then Erwin Schrödinger, an Austrian physicist, built on this idea and instead focused on the wave-like properties of electrons in order to help us better understand um, the atom's behavior. So Schrödinger stated that an electron at these energy levels resembled a standing wave which is a wave that's fixed at both ends, such as shown in this GIF here, and it seems to be stationary. So in this wave, we see that each of these red dots represents a node. So I'm just gonna highlight that right here. They represent a node, which is basically an area on the wave that has no lateral displacement. And in a standing wave, since the ends are fixed, there will always be some whole number of half waves present. So, we can see one half wave from one node to the next. In Schrodinger's representation of an atom, the electrons were represented with a standing wave around the nucleus. Each standing wave had to consist of a whole number of wavelengths, which is where we get those values of n equals one, two, three, and four from, and so forth, of course. Now, there are only some circular orbits that have the right circumference that to fit a whole number of standing waves into it, such as this orbit below, which this circumference can accommodate um, four whole wavelengths in it. All the other orbits that don't hold a whole number of wavelengths where their circumference actually corresponds to you know, a mixed fraction, those, these waves will actually undergo destructive interference, which cancels out the wave entirely so they don't even exist, such as this wave here. This circumference corresponds to uh, n equals four and one third wavelengths, which we don't often see, and this wave doesn't exist since it cancels out. So this idea is consistent with the knowledge that electrons can only exist at certain energy levels around the nucleus, you know, that idea of quantization. So Schrodinger's work with quantum mechanics even led to the development of Schrodinger's wave equation, which allows us to determine an, an electron's energy level. Now, a big question remains, where can we find an electron within an atom? Bohr's model made it seem really easy, but the answer in reality is really complicated. A scientist named Werner Heisenberg developed Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which states that it's impossible to know both an electron's exact position and its velocity simultaneously. We can actually only ever predict where an electron is going to be found. So we can actually use wave functions, which are derived from Schrodinger's equation uh, to determine our atomic orbitals. Basically, an atomic orbital, unlike what we saw in Bohr's model, are regions where electrons are most likely to be found. It's not a certain thing, it's very high probability. However, these wave functions don't actually tell us anything about how these electrons move or the pathways that they are on. In reality, we don't know how electrons move within an atom but we have used wave functions to develop these three-dimensional electron probability densities, which are regions around the atom in space where electrons are likely to be found. So here, if we look at the atom on the right, we see that these darker recent regions represent a higher density, which corresponds to a higher electron density, which means that we're more likely to find an electron in this region. In kind of the opposite sense, we see here that in between these different orbitals, we have um, regions with zero density. They're almost black like the background. And these correspond to areas where electrons 
have zero probability of ever being found, and they're referred to as nodes. So these ideas all form the fundamentals of the quantum mechanical model.